last week on um, disruptive innovations was a great uh, introduction and our discussion on it was was really good. So uh, one thing I noticed, one thing that stuck out to me going through the book is that disruptive innovation should be viewed as a marketing problem. And I think our discussion last week hit on that because if, if you're going to management and saying, I have this great idea, our competitors aren't doing it, but it's what our clients want, they just don't know it yet. First of all, even if you're in management, upper management probably wouldn't go for it, but if you're not in management, I think your chances of getting that approved are even less. So I'd like to keep this to 15 minutes and then have questions afterward, if that's all right. Um, from the book, some examples, computer hard disks, um, like this, which Dr. Harris was nice enough to bring. Um, steel mini mills, hydraulic excavators, motorcycles, and insulin. And I wanted to talk about insulin for a second because it made me think, um, my wife and I have three kids, and every time she's pregnant, it's, it's nine months of growing up the whole time. It's hyperemesis for video. Mm -hmm. it's, so I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have like an inexpensive, like an immunoassay way to test her blood at home to see what the HCG hormone is and then get the right medicine, but alas, it's not like insulin. It's not that simple. So what this presentation and what I'd like to do is present examples that I, and, and ask you, are they disruptive or are they sustained? So uh, Hewlett Packard let Steve Wozniak of uh, Microsoft walk out the door with his design for the Apple computer. <coughs> no, not Microsoft, Apple. The Xerox Park Research Institute invented modern graphic operating systems like Windows, but Apple and Microsoft sold them. Disruptive or sustained. Um, this is information that I've got from this website here, electrifyingtimes.com. Cold fusion has been largely developed, worked on by Maverick scientists working with mainstream institutions. Toyota and Electric Power Research Institute have done some of the most impressive cold fusion research, but they put the results aside and canceled or scaled back programs, apparently because managers within these organizations are hostile toward cold fusion. If no one else is doing it, it can't be done, let's move on. We're not going to keep putting uh, you know, funds for research and development on this subject. So, um, briefly, Dr. David Huber, this, this is about, this is really a lot to read, it might be too much just for this slide, but he came up basically with the idea for optical fiber networks. So, to me what that means is he saw how much traffic the internet would have and he realized that if you have a simple phone cord, that's not going to be enough. Eventually, an Ethernet cord will also not be enough. So he came up with an idea uh, that would handle the traffic, but uh, it wasn't accepted by the company he was working for. So he left and founded his own company and presented it. And left with, in May 1997, he left with $300 million worth of stock. In June of that year, founded another company to develop the world's first all-optical fiber network. So is that disruptive or sustained? Marriott International. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't, you can't see it very well. It's November 2011 to March 1998, kind of their profit chart. So as the company grew larger and larger, they decided not to buy Disney, which was for sale back in, I believe, the early 80s. They sold almost all of their real estate properties, which I didn't know. Uh, and that freed them from property taxes and increased profits for shareholders. From that point on, they have been primarily a hotel management company. So that's interesting. I mean, you see the Marriott signs everywhere, but they don't own the buildings, right? They're a hotel management company. So the hotels hire them and let them advertise. They get a fee from the hotel, and they get the advertising. So, disruptive or sustained. Uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway purchased a majority share in companies who would keep as much management staff as possible. They didn't want to install new management. He didn't want to put in new CEOs or anything. He would prefer to keep as many of them as possible. Um, 
which is kind of rare in itself when you're talking about buying companies, mergers, and acquisitions. So bonuses for management are performance-based, uh, unlike other large companies, which give bonuses based on overall company growth. And this is from November 2011 to 1990, almost. So it hasn't, obviously, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway haven't performed normally or poorly. I don't think they've been sustaining. I think they've been more of a disruptive company if you look over time. Um, have any of you seen the movie The Social Network? If you haven't seen it, you should see it because I think there are definitely some scenes, one specific scene that really hits on uh, innovation. There, there's two of the early founders of Facebook having lunch with Sean Parker. And he's like, yeah, you, you know, there's not a lot of money in free music, but especially when you're getting sued by everyone who's been to the Grammys, but that's all right because we still won. One of them says, you, you, you didn't win, you lost, right, right, in court. You declared bankruptcy, they sued you, you lost. And Sean Parker says, yeah, we lost uh, in court, but what did that become? I mean, Napster was, I, I want to take a second and talk about Napster because when I was a teenager, it was the coolest thing. I could go on there and I found a bootleg of uh, Have a Cigar by Pink Floyd. This is so cool. It's 14 minutes long. It's live. <laughs> this is the coolest thing. But now you have, like, you have the successor website companies like YouTube. And I can find, like, Every, every precursor song to every major hit Pink Floyd ever had. And it's wonderful. And it's free. So um, I can see why other companies would say no to ideas like this. <laughs> so um, I, was, I was watching an interview with Sean Parker, who, went, who founded Napster and then went to Plaxo and then went to Facebook as his first uh, president. And then left about a year later. So, he said, in 10 years ago, the global music industry went from 45 billion to 15 billion. I'm not sure specifically what he meant by that, like what that entailed, but I think, you know, you look at 2009 compared to 1999, about 27 billion to uh, 17, 17 billion, so that's, that's quite a significant loss. Um, Steve Jobs, we talked about last week, I want to talk about this, uh, and I think this is a really interesting chart to think about just for a second. Um, he was forced out of Apple, which he founded, created by John Scully in 1985, so on the graph that would be back here. Acquired, he acquired Pixar, founded Next, and then came back to Apple in, uh, I believe, 1997. So. Microsoft, you see, it's it's uh, you know they cornered the corner of the market. They've got an early lead, and they're ahead of Apple. And then along this time, you see iTunes, you see iPads, you see iPods. And at this point, Apple, their revenue is more than Microsoft, which is quite disruptive if you're if you're beating Microsoft. So that's something to consider. This is March 2010 to December 1989. Um, so. And, and uh, I think this next slide speaks to our discussion last week about, you know, presenting ideas to management. Carl Icahn said, current management, management is anti-Darwinian. CEOs pick people who are dumber than they are. It's, it's not a tip. You're not going to lose your job. You're not going to lose your job to someone dumber than you, right? So, so uh, is it true? I work at the Department of Housing. I thought that it's an interesting dynamic. There's uh, headquarters versus field mentality, owners versus tenants. It's very disruptive. It makes a lot less get done. Um, there's also a former secretary, Jack Kemp, who suggested that all of the tenants on public housing and affordable housing, they be allowed to purchase their units. So they own them, kind of like condos. So that disruptive or sustain. Take the owners out of the equation. Um, Last week we talked a little bit about green energy. Uh, in an interview I heard Dr. Christian say it has a breeze critical mass because it's competing against entrenched energy providers. Um, I believe it's in the book actually when he talks about if you were to introduce green energy in areas where
they're fortunate and lucky to have be able to power a light bulb for five hours a day. Then it could take off. Then you could have it potentially replace uh, conventional energy. So, and that's a question I had. Like a lot of states have tried green energy not at a macro level, like Congress tries again and again and again, but at a micro level. Like for example, if you set up solar or if you have geothermal and any energy you don't use, you can send it back to the utilities and they send you a check. That seems disruptive to me. I think that will last. Um, I don't want to go over in time, but if you haven't heard of Google, please raise your hand. I'll let you know. It's, it's a wonderful search engine and it started by graduate students at Stanford. So their initial public offering in August 04 sold 19 million shares at a price of $85 per share. So that valued the company at $23 billion. But what's their product? What do they provide? Nothing. They use search. They, you, you type something in and search. So, <coughs> I, I, I mean, I can understand how, how large companies would not see, you know, okay, so we can advertise on a search engine that's being started by a couple of people in the 20s. Why would we invest in that? But I, I can see um, how, how it's hard, you know, seeing what's next, like uh, the innovative solution suggestion. It's not that easy. Um, so in May 2011, unique visitors of Google surpassed a billion for the first time, and that's an 8.4% increase from 2010. Facebook. Um, there are 6.9 billion people on the planet. I think we just a couple weeks ago hit 7 million. There's 800 million users of Facebook. So that's 8.7% of the world population. And that's not counting people 13 and under and people who, you know, assisted living, nursing homes who probably aren't that interested. So it's interesting. This is uh, when Sean Parker got involved back here and then here, left the company. Mark Zuckerberg, who created it, is still there. He's been there the whole time. And um, is that disruptive or sustaining? What is the product Facebook sells? Friendship. Friendship. <laughs> Exclusivity, right? You can't be a friend of someone unless they accept. So, I mean, just just looking at that, it's it's. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's really interesting. Um, if you could make company like that. December 2004, September 2011. So, um, yeah. And I think Facebook and Google are having, they have restrictions of, like in, in China and other companies like that. You can't search for anything and you can't upload anything. In Germany, you can't upload certain like Nazi images. So Facebook has to account for that. So um, this, I heard, is, is I kind of like to get into the discussion part. Federal Reserve now potentially backstopping $75 trillion worth the Bank of America's derivatives trade. I think this speaks to the Occupy Wall Street Tea Party. Why is there a bailout? or bailing out more. Um, so it's definitely backstopping $75 trillion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Bank of America is shifting its derivatives and its Merrill Lynch investment banking unit to its depository arm, which has access to the Fed discount window and is protected by the FDIC. What does that mean? So, what that means is that the investment bank's European derivatives exposure is now backstopped by US taxpayers. So, basically, it's like dominoes. So, Bank of America's derivatives say they fell, they failed, do, and then who's going to bail out the Federal Reserve? You? All of us, probably. So is this disruptive or sustaining? Now the Fed and the FDIC are fighting as to whether this was sound. Should this have been done? Uh, even if it shouldn't, what would you do now? I mean, how, when, when you're dealing with $75 trillion, how do you want to do that? The Fed wants to give relief to the bank holding company, which is under heavy pressure. So, they didn't these, get regulatory approval to do this, they just did it to request a price and down price. You gotta know the right people. 
going 75 trillion. I mean, this is, I, I think this is 